Hey, welcome everyone. Ken Bergen here from Foodie Coaches with my good friend Jimmy Griffith, who's our senior senior coach. And uh, we've got the opportunity for you to ask questions, shoot the breeze, share some comments. And if you've got any comments or questions, please drop them in the comments below where you can see us. Hey, Jimmy, how are you going? I am well, thanks, Ken. I'm well. Um, you know, I live for this stuff, so I'm really excited. Nice. Good. Yeah. We can't see you yet, but uh, we're going to do that. We're going to fix that up pretty quickly. We just get you us both sharing. Anyway, there you are. Okay. So everyone, not sure how many, we got, you know, more nearly 3000 people in this group. So there's lots of experience, lots of people with uh, lots of opinions and lots of issues, lots of wins happening. Um, Jimmy, I'm always kind of interested in the stories you tell, not kind of personal stories, but you often have some sort of some nice successes that you share with us about um, business owners who are doing clever things. What's something you've noticed in the last couple of days that you were talking maybe to some members or people you've been talking about membership? Well, uh, first, I take umbrage that you think my personal story is boring, but... Um... <laughs> But speaking, you know, what we're talking about today about system procedures and really dialing things in, I was actually just talking to a member this morning and we were analysing uh, wage costs and wage costs per hour and how to dial this in. And by breaking that down, we really found that there was a couple of hours dead between service where not only were we overstaffed, but that was also bringing the general morale and culture down because people were kind of, um, you know, everyone kicked down a gear as opposed to staying up. Yes. So, what we're doing about that is we've actually established. So this is like a restaurant or a cafe. What style of business? The cafe. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I guess it applies at a restaurant as well. Anytime in between services, basically. So they have a morning rush, bit of a lull, and then it kicks into lunch. And what we're actually doing there is we're splitting this shift up into two parts and procedurizing the end of shift pack down as opposed to the end of day pack down. What it's allowing us to do is ensure that in that quiet period, we can go from two staff down to one staff, but that person has everything they need set up ready to go. So it's not stressful for them. Mm. Every time we tried it in the past with this member, uh, that one person fell apart because it, it calmed down and then they had all this pack up to do, plus customers, plus all these things. So by putting this procedure in, 15 minute procedure, this person can now handle it by themselves and we're saving about an hour 45 of wages each part of the shift mm, times seven times a week or six times a week or something like that nice yeah it's an interesting one you know that shift change thing and you know the end of every shift you know owners sometimes think oh just get people to keep producing or something like that but you know the plane is coming in for landing isn't it it's pretty hard to <laughs> make that peak production time <laughs> and the beauty of this system we've created is that it puts a really clean full stop on that person's shift because they have a clear procedure to follow, a clear checklist of what needs to be done. And it means that when the service quietens down, they're working through the checklist, checklist is done. And if they've had time to finish that checklist, they're no longer needed. Mm, nice. A really clean transition. We can keep this person at 100% for the full time they needed 100%. And then once they're 100%, they're done. So I know that tracking um, labor hours against sales activity is something you get people doing pretty carefully it's one of those things you really need to lean in don't you and you know do it microscopically almost well what are some of the other things you've found when you've had those discussions with people you know to kind of align costs with sales well we talk about procedures for our team we often don't have system procedures for ourselves as the business owner to actually track these numbers and that makes it really difficult so we look at an idea of an hourly breakdown of costs, uh, wages, for example, and it seems bigger than Ben Hur. If we can systemize this and start pulling a couple of weeks, put an hourly breakdown in there and then understand what that looks like. Once we have a picture of the problem areas, we can start focusing on them and then zoom that view out. And I'd recommend just doing daily. After you have the microscopic view, start looking at daily with parameters of what's mm -hmm. acceptable, what's not. And if it's not acceptable, then zoom in microscope on that day. So you're yeah, because because so yeah. many operators they're they're kind of too impatient, aren't they? Or maybe they just actually don't have the data in the kind of right format or easily accessible. Well, how how do I what what do I need to kind of zoom in close like you're recommending? 
the biggest thing that our members struggle when we first start working with them, and it's why we first start working on this and clearing that up, is data overload. You know, if you look at a PL, for example, over a year, there's about 4,000 cells in there just full of numbers and it's overload. So whenever you're looking at a numbers question, the first question you want to ask yourself is, why am I looking at it? What do I want to achieve? And then what's the simplest format to look at that in and look at that. And if that answer isn't clear enough for you, then take another layer, go a layer deeper. So mm -hmm. if this is your food cost and you say, I haven't got anything broken down and I don't know where it's coming in, what's going on, who cares? That mindset is just going to slow you down. Look at what you have, see what you need to look better and then put that system in place. Just not looking isn't a solution. So mm -hmm. make it simple, five, K, five KPIs, focus on them and then get more detail as you need to get more detail. Okay, so what what are some other sort of surprises that people have? Well, just on on the the labour KPI, yeah. You know, I mean, usually the biggest expense category for most people. What are some other kind of surprising details, or shocking, or occasionally pleasantly surprising details you've you've had people discovering when you work with them? Um, there's a couple of great ones. I'd say one of them is having the right people in the right place. If you know that somebody's really good at something, then sure, try and develop them in other areas, but keep them where they're strong. They'll be enjoying it more, they'll be better at it, and they'll be more efficient at that job. Mm -hmm. So all of working towards your genius. And if you can fill your team and realize that not everyone's going to be amazing at everything, but a complementary team is greater than the sum of its parts, you can have increased efficiency across the board. Um, mm -hmm. Another big standout that surprises a lot of our members when they first implement is that more people don't mean more work. In fact, it can be messy. I know we've all probably had that experience running a cafe or a bar or a restaurant or a catering job where you think there are too many bodies around. Mm -hmm. Things get messy. Everybody's doing a half job. And sometimes we'll find that, you know, removing one person from the kitchen, one person from the front of house will actually make everything run smoother, wait times might increase by three or four minutes, which gives the team time to get that extra coffee in or that extra glass of wine. Uh, everybody's still happy and the service can be individualized without that frantic running around. No one okay, interesting. So, so the wait time is a manageable thing too, isn't it? You know, we're sometimes thinking like speed faster is the only thing we should focus on, but you're saying manage it in a different way. How do we communicate that to customers? <clears throat> There's something we live by at Foodie Coaches, which is you're not in the business of serving food and drink. You're in the business of creating an experience. People can have food and drink at home. They can pick up a sausage roll at 7-Eleven if they're that way inclined. I don't know why they would be. <laughs> we're really there, hungry. <laughs> yeah, we're out there providing experience. And that experience, you know, it could be fine dining, it could be grab and go, whatever it is. But why are they here to do that? If we're talking about a service sense, then what's the best experience for this person going to be? Why are we trying to get our wait time down to under six minutes if somebody's out for a Sunday breakfast? They're out to spend some time. They want a couple of coffees. How do we give them this experience in such a way that they're going to enjoy it the most? And you know, no one wants to wait an hour for their food. Mm. But a well-timed dining experience with a sequence of service in place that seats the customer. It has their sparkling water at the table. They've already spent $9. They have their coffee straight away. That's $16 plus the nine, we're at 25 then we bring that food out maybe with a little starter then we come back and you know second round of coffees is it going to work out better and it's a numbers question to have this person this table stay an hour and spend a hundred dollars or have two tables in half an hour each spending fifty dollars each what's going mm -hmm. to give a better reputation what's easier on the team how does this balance out yeah, interesting. So, so I mean, there's this overwhelm too. I know you've you've talked about it a few times to me with people when they're starting, and you know, maybe they're making okay money, but you know, as you kind of uncover things, it's a little bit look like opening the door of an extremely messy garage, isn't it? It's like, oh my god, where where the hell do I start? <laughs> How do you approach that kind of overwhelm too? Because because for a lot of people, it's just shut the garage and run away. <laughs> Oh yeah, one of the main reasons that I think people aren't looking at their numbers is because they know they're not gonna be good and it stresses them out. Mm -hmm. um, key things to remember, your numbers don't care. They don't have feelings. They're not out to get you. Any emotion you're attaching to your numbers is coming from you. And if that emotion is causing you to not look at them, you're never gonna be able to solve them. So 
a lot of people, they come to me the first time and they say, my numbers are a mess. I'm embarrassed. I can't do this because mm -hmm. I don't have data. You can clean up a mess that you can see. You can't start cleaning it up until you've surveyed it and you've looked at it. So, yeah, okay. That's a good saying. <laughs> yeah. You just yeah. got to start looking, see what's going on, start pulling through. If the data isn't great, it's not ideal, but it's what we have. Work with what you have and work on refining it. Mm. Um, it's not what an option. Mm. So labor is kind of number one. And then the other one is that actually, before we get into cost of goods, I, I just um, wanted to get your response to something. You know, we often people, there is first kind of issues, cut, 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 you know, shaving an hour off here, an hour off there. And you've explained some logical ways to do that, that actually kind of energize as well as cost, saving costs, they energize and make everything more efficient. But sometimes it's just it seems like a bit of a blunt instrument, just kind of hacking away. And I've got a little saying, you know, they cut muscle, not fat sometimes. How, how do you approach that with people when you're talking to them? One of the most common things your accountant's going to say is your labor's too high. And as you said, cut, cut, cut. People attack it. And the, the fact is, it's really easy to lower your labor costs. Sack two people, work 80 hours yourself. Don't pay yourself. Mm -hmm. There you go. You've just saved 80 hours of wages and you're never going to move forward in the business because you now have no time to drive the ship. You're not paying yourself, you're burning out. So the first question that I always look at, yes, if you're overstaffed, reduce your hours, but you can't put half a person behind a coffee machine. So the better question is, what do we have to do to afford the staff that we need to operate? So if you've got a base level of staff, you can't cut that lower or you're not going to provide the service you need. Mm -hmm. The fastest way to do that nine times out of 10 is to improve your team culture and work on that customer experience to increase the average spend. If you've got a cafe doing, you know, $20 a spend, a thousand covers a week, million dollar business, you increase that average spend by $2, you've got two grand yeah, a week. Yeah, because you're not saying we've got to go and get another um, 200 customers a week, which we certainly like to do, but you're saying, the quickest thing is actually just work harder with the people we've already got. That's the key. The people you already have. I speak to people and they say, I'm going to start opening nights and they increase the revenue. Or I'm going to mm. start opening Sundays. I'm going to start opening earlier in the morning. And all of those plans thought out properly can be great, but they come with additional costs. If you increase the spend on the staff you already had, no one needs more staff than $2 extra spend. And it means that your revenue increases, your labor stays the same, so the percentage drops. Your overhead stay the same as the percentage drops. And the only expense coming out of that increase in revenue is the food cost. So just, just on the, the labour thing too, seems like most Cluey operators are now using online rostering. Any tips on for people who are using rostering systems and you know to kind of fine-tune them? Any a few years ago, right? All these systems came out. I'm getting, you know, I'm just saying, mate, 10 years ago, all these systems came out. They were full of glitches. They didn't really work. Um, they were a bit painful to use. And over time, there's been a war of attrition. The ones that are left are all pretty good. So use them. They've been developed. If you're spending money on rostering software and you're just using it as a glorified spreadsheet, you're not getting the full capability out of it. Mm -hmm. Use the information. Understand, you know, what, what hours cost you, what your total roster is costing you, what that does to your sales drag things across, make sure it aligns with your zero or your QuickBooks or your MYOB. Um, save yourself the time and monetize that time in your head. If this took me an hour to do manually and this does it in no time at all, is that worth the expense? Nine times mm. out of 10. Mm, if you nice. Tell us about some of the uh, kind of, well, maybe not horror stories, but you know, scary stories you've uncovered with a few people recently around cost of goods, food costs, beverage costs, and things like that, and, and how are you approaching them? Look, I think, you know, horror stories and scary stories, for me, that always comes down to wastage and portioning of procedures, because that's, what's, that's when someone thinks they've done the work and they can't understand it why. For a lot of people, they either haven't actually done the work to understand their theoretical costs and their actual costs, and likely because they haven't been shown. For me, that's not, a horror story it's not scary because if you haven't been shown something you don't know how to do it you only know what you know mm -hmm. and they're solvable problems if you don't know something learn it that's exactly what we do 
the horror stories for me are when, you know, I speak to someone that switched on, they say, my theoretical food cost is 26%, everything's good, I know what it is, procedures left, right and center, but my PL is saying 45% and I don't know why. That's where we've got to start going digging. And one of our members a while ago, I remember he had that situation and he couldn't figure it out why. Um, he mystery shopped himself, everything was coming out portioned at all, there's no wastage. And it wasn't for about a month when he realized and he mystery shopped himself at a busy service that his team, when they were busy, were overloading the, the, the food. They were just grabbing handfuls and chucking it on. They weren't trying to steal from him. They weren't trying to stitch him up. They were just busy and they were getting sloppy. And this was working out to be about a 12% food cost problem for him. Wow, that's huge. I mean, that, that must, they must have doubled the portion sizes, did they? <laughs> Things were going, it, it, was, um, it was like wraps. Yeah, and the wraps uh, were going out. When it was quiet, they were going out perfectly measured and done. When, they were, when it was busy, they were going out just obscene, you know? And of course, customers loved it. They were getting a bargain. Yeah. And then they complained when they got the normal size next time and how, why are you trying to rip me off? <laughs> yeah. And all it took was for him to do the legwork, identify what the situation was. And the next day, everything was prepared before service in a sous vide and a bain marie, portion control. And then the wraps were built from those uh, controlled portions. Cost mm -hmm. him probably 100 bucks in packaging to actually portion everything, plus another hour or two in wages. And 12% on a business of his scale I don't know if his number's in front of me, but we're talking a few hundred thousand dollars. Mm, wow, huge. And that's always amazing when you find it. It's a great news story, but it's always upsetting when you realize there was three months where there's 40 grand gone down the drain. Mm, mm. So I've often thought about hospo people as not very good at numbers. You know, I mean, it's something I guess you learn, uh, especially when it's got dollar signs attached to it. But how do you get people more comfortable with, you know, scrunch, crunching spreadsheets or tracking down numbers and diving into zero or those sorts of things? How much do I, do they need to do? How much maybe can they give to someone else? Well, what's, what's the story with financial literacy? It's a great question. Um, first things first, I'd say don't outsource tracking your numbers until you're across them 100%. You need to be hands-on with them. You need to know what you're outsourcing and why. Uh, secondly, no one likes red numbers and that's where people get upset and they stop doing it. When your numbers are in the black and you know why and you're causing it, you start liking them a lot more. It becomes, a, when you look forward to your weekly numbers, because they're going to show you how much money you made, that's exciting. Okay. That's interesting. So like red numbers is like red flags in relationships. Stay away. Don't look yeah. at it. <laughs> Close that spreadsheet. <laughs> it's a great analogy. You know, red flags in your relationship, you've got two options. You can ignore the problem and you're going to be single pretty soon, or you can look at it, see what the problem is, work at fixing it. And you've got a good relationship. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to the actual tech, the how to, to really track your numbers properly, you are going to need at least a basic understanding of Excel. And that terrifies people if they're not good at numbers because it's all the cells and the formula and mm. forget it all. Google. If you don't know how to do something in Excel, just type in, how do I do this in Excel? And there will be an article and a video explaining exactly how to do it. I do it almost every day. 5,000 YouTube videos to show you in detail. Yeah. I use Excel almost every day and I Google something in Excel almost every day. Mm. because, you know, oh, I, I did that once. I know it can be done. How do I do it quickly? Um, and that's for tricky things because I'm pretty scared at the basics. But if you don't know how to add two cells together, don't say this is too hard. Just say, how do I add two cells together in Excel in Google? And it will tell you instantly. Yeah. You, you're actually, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, what does it take to be a good business owner in hospitality? And, you know, often it's, you know, a big smile and customer focus and customer is, you know, king and all that. But you're putting together a bunch of kind of new skills, I think, which are pretty much um, non-negotiable, I'd say, prepared to crunch numbers and understand them and be patient and notice things. And yeah, well, what are some other of these kind of new skills maybe that people didn't realise that they needed? I think you know, there's a couple, there's not too many, obviously around your marketing and around your people management. For me, the big distinction is that a lot of people get into this industry because of the creative side they love cooking they love people they love service they love creating that experience um 
it can't be mutually exclusive of the analytical side because as a business owner, you owe it to the community, you owe it to your team, and you owe it to yourself to have a profitable business. Otherwise, that business won't be there. You as the owner will burn out. Your team won't have their jobs. The community won't have this thing you created for them. And this industry built around service has a real hang up around making money. Um, you know, I don't want to charge too much. I don't want to do this. Mm. And it leaves them squeezed in the middle with nothing left and doing 100 hours and not actually making a profit. So and one have- one one part of that big heart, quote unquote, is, you know, I don't want to charge people too much. I don't want to rip them off. And then there's another part of it too is I don't want to put too much pressure on my staff. I don't want to turn them into McDonald's workers where they got to sell fries with that. Um, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of expectations to be unbusinesslike, isn't it? Yeah, and businesses just don't exist if they don't have that bottom line, or they burn out, and that's what happens. And yeah. when you, when you see a really thriving business that everybody loves, chances are the reason it's thriving is because it's making enough cash that the owner can focus on keeping it amazing, providing that experience. The team are all happy because they have that culture built out. Um, the community knows it's there for the long haul, and it's going to be a consistent product. And yeah, the- yeah, because that, that that you you got to have you know profit is also used for reinvest in, um, you know, new furniture or some better machinery or a paint job because boy we really bash around our premises, don't we? You know, if you've got a thousand people through each week, it's like a kid's bedroom or something. Absolutely, think of the trade off. You know, um, I I'm, I'm not charging enough for my meals which means that my customers come into a venue with falling apart toilets. Yeah. What, you know, what would you, would you, would you rather pay extra $2 for your dinner and know you're going to a restaurant that's clean and tidy and where where you're safe to go to the loo. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, So Jimmy, we're just, we're wrapping up in a a few minutes and this everyone is our first Q and a and uh, really Great to get started with this. We'll be doing them every two weeks. Jimmy will be back in a few weeks' time. Um, we've got other coaches and other uh, guests, industry guests and experts that we're going to have on. Um, just tell me about when you people start as Foodie Coaches members. What are some of the things that you kind of do early on to kind of get people saving money, making money? What, what's the process to you know, get people getting results really quickly? key focus when we start working with members is themselves and making sure they understand exactly where their time is going and are monetizing it and reallocating the scrubbing the toilets, the washing the dishes, the running and picking up deliveries into things that will actually grow the business. Okay, that's not the answer I expected. I, th- I thought you were going to say, first we look at the roster and then we there, but you're actually saying we've got to actually make the time to yeah do the important stuff. No one can do these things for you. So you need to be able to do them and have the confidence to do them. And that's where we help our members first up is just saying, these are the roles that you need to be fulfilling in your business that no one else will do for you. So if time is being taken by things that other people can do for you, you need to reallocate that because no one can do your numbers for you. Mm. No one can grow your team culture for you. No one can understand what you need to understand to be successful and profitable long-term. Stop washing the dishes. Yeah, nice. You know, the, the the old time management thing is a bit of a cliche and people read the book or watch the YouTube video or whatever. You're giving a different, much more potent, I think, approach to this. Yeah, yeah. I like it. For me, it's money. All comes down to money. Hmm. If your business is running profitably and successfully, and let's say you're making $100,000 profit a year on top of the wage you're paying yourself, Work out that hourly rate and then ask yourself if you've ever paid someone that's that to do dishes. Then take yeah. that back. Up it's very, very easy to get trapped in those $20 an hour jobs, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Just cool. to save we money. know how to do yeah. them. They've got to be done. It's easy. I'm good at it. I'll do it better than anybody else and I'll yeah. just do it. You don't have time to train someone else to do it the way it needs to be done. Mm. Hey, Jimmy, really always enjoy getting your insights and I know you kind of... Uh, funnel just amazing work you do with hundreds of people over well you're a restaurant and bar owner yourself at one time so you know the real pressures but uh, the the coaching work you do with people is pretty incredible anyway great to get your insights and uh, 
people drop some comments below this will be you know you can watch the video again and if you've got any questions for follow-up or for jimmy um what's the best way for people to make contact jimmy for if they want to have a chat more about you know getting your assistance yeah look you know drop a comment below this um i'm a member of the Profit hospitality owners group so you can find me in there and send me a dm as well uh and yeah this is what we do we do it all day and we love doing it so mm. Terrific. Thanks. Really appreciate your time. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.